build them. And it does that with the genetic code. There are, there are four letters in the genetic code. There's A, C, T, and G. And when I say letters, that's kind of a, um, actually just four different types of molecules. They're shaped, shaped differently. So DNA is made of four different types of particles. And they form this big long chain. I've got half of the chain grayed out here. So you can kind of only see the top half. Uh, that's because the cell reads the DNA. Just It only reads one of the strands. It doesn't read both the strands. And it reads the DNA three letters at a time, three nucleotides at a time. And every three nucleotides tell the cell which amino acid to grab and add to the chain as the protein is being built. So if you change the letters in, in, the, genetic, in the genetic sequence, that will change what amino acid gets added into that amino acid chain. And that will end up changing the three-dimensional structure of a protein. So this is really cool. This is, you've got a line of code, essentially, that is dictating the three-dimensional structure of a protein. It's absolutely fascinating how this works. And this is, this is the foundation of life. And this it, mutations, changes in the genetic code, or in the genetic sequence, rather, changes in the genetic sequence, that's essentially how evolution happens. Mutations will edit things, and some of those edits end up making proteins that suck at doing what they used to do. And so it ends up being bad for the organism. Sometimes those changes end up being better for the organism. And it does better at surviving and reproducing. And that is how evolution works. A simplified version of how evolution works. So, any any questions on that stuff before I go on? Yes, there is one that, that asks um, how fast this process happens. How fast are proteins built? Yes. Yeah, how long does it take to actually make a, a complete protein chain? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know, but it's like if you were to watch it, there's actually videos on uh, YouTube where they show it uh, in real time, and it's super, super fast. I mean, it's... It depends on the length of the protein, too. It, I mean, a small protein could be yeah, like It depends on the protein. So some proteins, you know, this one that I drew here looks like it might be like 100. Uh, amino acids long. We have yeah. one in our muscle cells that's thirty thousand <laughs> amino acids long. So they get they get pretty big, They're huge molecules. But I mean, it's it looks like uh, it looks insane when you're watching uh, the animation of it in real time. It's it looks it's it's happening so fast you can't see what's happening. It's and a, a minor correction from uh, CRISPR Cas9 because uh, he's right. The DNA isn't read three three at a time. The RNA is read three base at a time. Yes. Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. I I didn't want to get into the uh, RNA and ribosome exactly how that works, but yeah, it's it's the DNA is uh, transcribed into RNA first, and it's actually the RNA that's literally read, but it's 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 the message in the DNA that's read. So, yes, that's fascinating. All right, next slide here. So that that should be like enough basics. Well, here another quick review. So amino acids form proteins, and that, that protein, the shape of that protein is dictated by the genes, by, by our DNA. Those proteins go on to make living cells. Living cells make tissues. Tissues make organs. And yes, bones are organs. And then when all of those are together and functioning, you've got an organism. And uh, that's, that's the basics. Very cartoon version of how life does its thing. So next slide. So the discovery of the molecular clock, this happened, well, I suppose the discovery was earlier, but it was first published in 1962 by uh, uh, Linus Pauling. And he did a lot of research on hemoglobin and he was really interested in sickle cell anemia. And he started, I'm actually not sure if he's the one who figured out how to do this or if he was just using other people's technology, but he, he started unraveling hemoglobin Hemoglobin is this protein that we have in our blood cells, our red blood cells, and its job is to capture oxygen when blood flows near the lungs and then release that when it comes in contact with oxygen-starved tissue. And he, he was able to unravel the chain and then figure out the sequence of amino acids that exists inside that chain. And this was amazing because all mammals have red blood cells. 
and all mammals have hemoglobin. And so he was able to make actually all, all, uh, all vertebrates. There are a few exceptions. There's some fish that have, have uh, gotten rid of their hemoglobin because it's, it doesn't do well in cold water. But there's, um, in, in really cold, like in the Arctic and stuff. But for the most part, all vertebrates have hemoglobin. And he's like, he wondered, what would happen if I compare the differences in amino acid sequences of different hemoglobin from different species? I wonder if that would tell us anything cool about evolution. So he did it. He, he wrote this book in uh, 1962. It's the next slide um, has the title of the book. I can't remember what it was called. Ah, I can't read that. It's too <laughs> blurry. But oh, genetic. Uh, his, uh, what's that? Genetic equidistance. Equidistance. Yes. Well, down at the bottom there, there's the, um, there's the. Uh, oh. The, oh, I'll never be able I, to I that. Can... I can read it. It's it's molecular disease, evolution, and gen, genetic heterogeneity. I think heterogeneity. Yeah, there we go. Heterogeneity. So, there you go. By Zucker, he published this e. like Pauling L B. He published this, this amazing book that was actually people were really skeptical of it at first because what he found is that when he analyzed the amino acid sequences. He found that I actually made up these numbers. the The real numbers are in the book, and we'll look at we'll look at the real data, some real data later. But I made up numbers that are easy to add in your head. Here, so when you go, so actually, it's good that you came back to the slide. Sorry, go back to that oh, slide one back. more time. There we go. Yeah, there we go. So you can see here I've got human and mouse um, hemoglobin sequences. And you see that there's a mutation in the middle. There's a, and the mouse has a yellow amino acid where I've got a black one in the human. So he was counting up differences like that. He was, he was trying to, he was just counting the differences. That's all he was doing at this point. We go to the next slide. So here I've, I've got between humans and fish, there's 18 differences in their hemoglobin. And again, that's a number that I, I simplified. So we could do easy math, multiples of three here. And then he found that between rats and fish, it was also 18 differences. That's interesting. And then between humans and rats, there were six differences. And he realized that he could use this to build an evolutionary tree where you have the... Um, so it, if, if you accept the fact that evolution is a thing, both of these lineages, that, that number 18 between humans and fish, you need to divide that by two to figure out how many differences were evolving in each line that led the line that led up to humans and the line that led up to modern fish from their common ancestor. So humans, he assumed, must have had nine mutations in their hemoglobin. Fish must have had nine mutations in their hemoglobin since their common ancestor deep, deep in the past. So that's how he makes, he turns that number 18 into an evolutionary tree. And those numbers nine there represent, they represent time, but he didn't know how, how long each tick of time that is. You know, there's, there's nine mutations here. How long does it take for each mutation to occur? He didn't know. He just knows that there's nine of them between humans and fish. And there's nine, there's nine leading up to rats, nine leading up to fish, three leading up to humans, three leading up to rats. Um, and you could put those together to create an evolutionary tree like we have here with the humans and the rats and the fish all together there. And the really neat thing about this is you can count up, you know, we see in this graph that between the fish and the common ancestor between fish and humans and rats, the little um, circle at the bottom there, the, the line leading down to that from the fish has nine marks in it. The line leading down from the rat has three marks in it. And then below that, there's six marks. And so that equals nine. And this is the principle of genetic equidistance. And this was, this was really surprising that he found such perfect... It, the, numbers are, the numbers aren't as perfect as I'm showing here. I've got, in the next slide, I'll show you numbers a little bit more realistic. Um, what, he would find, what he would find is that sometimes you'd have... Uh, you know, an odd number here. So we've got 17 and you can't divide that evenly by two. So you have to make one note or one, uh, one line shorter than the other. But all of his numbers were just extremely, uh, 
they were so close to perfect that it was it was almost crazy. So this this principle of genetic equidistance, the numbers were so good that people had trouble believing that this is true. Like, how could hemoglobin track evolution this perfectly throughout time? You'd think that the rate of mutation would be fluctuating dramatically across evolutionary time, and you wouldn't be able to make uh, evolutionary trees like this, but you can. Uh, let's go to the next slide here. This is an evolutionary tree that Nathaniel Jensen has in his book, uh, Dr. Jensen, that he he has, which is showing the evolutionary tree made in the exact same way using uh, New World monkeys. And Nathaniel, I thought this was interesting when I was reading the book, he accepts evolution within New World monkeys. Uh, he thinks that it's evolution amongst them is fine. He doesn't accept evolution between like monkeys and humans, but he accepts it between different species of new world monkey. And he thinks that it happens just like normal biologists think that it happens. You have mutations and those accumulate over time and you can build these evolutionary trees like this. Notice the jagged edges where we have the names of the, uh, the species. Those jagged edges are because there are slight fluctuations in mutation rates in different lineages. But as you can see there, it's pretty dang, it's, it's pretty close to perfect. You can really make a really good tree just counting up mutations across deep evolutionary time. Now, Nathaniel thinks that this, when I say deep evolutionary time, he thinks that this is 4,000 years. And uh, other scientists would obviously disagree with that. But, um, you know, he thinks that this is the evolution of monkeys since Noah's Ark, uh, which is these, these new world monkeys here. Uh, an wow. evolutionary biologist would say that this is, this is showing several million, million years of evolution here. But, so That's Nathaniel accepts this, and he he uh, he understands how this works. He has no problem with it. He just has a problem with it when, if you show the next slide here, he has a problem with it when you take it past family boundaries. So New World monkeys evolving is okay, but humans and mice literally sharing a common ancestor, he's not okay with that. They share a common designer is his argument. And uh, I'll just let uh, Dr. Mays argue why that's not the best thing to think uh tomorrow so i won't i won't get into to my thoughts on that here but uh this is how a molecular clock works we look at differences between these molecules that are evolving the molecule has to be shared between all the species that that are that we're looking at so it has to be something that's used by all of them and that's not true for all organisms for example uh there's lots of proteins that plants have uh that humans don't have uh, we can't even find any similarities between them. So we, we couldn't build a tree using using those. But for animals, uh, but e even humans and plants, we do share a lot of genes. And we can build these trees even with, with animals and plants. And we can, we can go really deep into evolutionary time with these molecular clocks. Now, can we use this to make some kind of predictions? Like if we had a protein that um, is somewhat conserved and we said, okay, this is what we would expect for this protein to be. Um, in relationship to how we understand phylogenetics would be now, could we use that to say, okay, let's test to see if there was an amino acid substitutions and say, this is, this is the three substitutions or this is six substitutions. Can we actually make those kind of predictions by using this kind of modeling? Sorry, what, what kind of prediction are you asking? If, can we look at the amount of substitutions and say, okay, because of the, the way the proteins have been substituting amino acids, this is where it should fall in relationship to any other animal or to us. Yeah, yeah. So, so here I'm just showing the numbers of changes. But you can actually pinpoint what those changes are and build even more accurate trees, right? Like, uh, and furthermore, you can actually rebuild the ancestral protein. So there's a, there's a guy who does that. I'm forgetting his name right now. I've got his book around here somewhere. But he, uh, he, he spent his career resurrecting extinct proteins. He'll look at the protein in a mouse and look at that same protein in a human and then rebuild what the ancestral protein sequence would have been. He'll resurrect those. Would have there's, a, there's a guy who did that with um, pigments in um, corals to find out what color the ancestral coral was, which is pretty cool. Is that, is that how they did it with the dinosaurs as well? And would, that, would the protein be the same function as the ancestral one? Would the protein have the same? But you function wouldn't have as the DNA to sequence for a dinosaur, though, would you? 
Yeah, we'll the, the, the problem with dinosaurs, yeah, we don't have their we don't have their DNA. Um, gotcha. Or their 